All right. Uh, as we all kind of virtually file in, I'll just get us started here. Um, thank you everyone for virtually coming out tonight. I'm Gracie, I'm the events coordinator for PRINT. A few things just before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the event, please feel free to enter them either in the chat box, which is on the bottom right, or in the question and answer function, which is on the bottom bar of your screen. Um, I'd also like to start by quickly thanking Mechanics Hall for their partnership in this event. Uh, though we unfortunately can't host it in their beautiful historic library, we're so thankful for their partnership and promotion on the event. Um, and they are, of course, a member-based organization, so I will include the link to their page. Feel free to go check them out. They are fantastic. Uh, if you'd like a copy of tonight's book, I'll include the link to the print page in the chat box. So you can just click on through. And now for tonight's speakers. Kate Moss is a multiple New York Times and number one internationally best-selling author with sales of more than 8 million copies in 38 languages. Kate is the founder director of the Women's Prize of Fiction, for Fiction, excuse me, a visiting professor at the University of, is it Chichester? That's the one thing I forgot to ask. Chichester. Chichester. Ch yeah. Americanizing this horror. Yeah, I know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Nobody will know. Uh, and was awarded an officer of the Order of the British Empire for Services to Literature. She divides her time between the United Kingdom and France. Julia Spencer Fleming is the New York Times bestselling author of One Was a Soldier and an Agatha Anthony Dillisbury McCavity and Gumshoe Award winner. She studied acting and history at Ithaca College and received her JD at the University of Maine School of Law. Her books have been shortlisted for the Edgar, Nero Wolfe, and Romantic Times RC Awards. Julia lives in Southern Maine. So please join me in virtually welcoming Kate and Julia. So Kate, I guess the first thing that I have to ask is, should I refer to you as Dame Kate? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be Sir, really. Oh, Dame makes me think of pantomimes and, you know, yes, men yes. dressed up as women in big trousers, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we'll stick with Kate, I think. <laughs> okay, that works out very, very well. So, um, oh gosh, I have so much to talk about, but we should probably open with talking about um, the book, part of the series that we're here for which I have very handily here, um, City of Tears, yeah. which is the second in the Burning Chamber series. Look at that, we've got matching yep. <laughs> So, um, and I have to say, I wanna start out by saying, I love historical fiction. Uh, I, I am one of these people that I adore reading it. I deeply admire my friends who write it because um, I don't like doing research <laughs> and the amount of research. So let's start there. I was just blown away when I started, I started with the first book, The Burning Chambers, which I advise everyone to do and get the second one. Um, but just um, your mastery of detail without being pedantic about it, I really felt that you know, the, 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 the setting came alive, the, the, you know, 16th century Southern France sort of, you know, came alive for me. And I, I'm just wondering, how do you do that? You know, how, what sort of research process do you, and most importantly, I think for a lot of us, how do you avoid dumping everything you find out in huge, you know, info, info swaths? Yeah. Well, f firstly, such a pleasure to meet you, Julia, in this way and, and be with you. I'm a great fan of your books and to be taking part in this. I wish I was in the Mechanics Hall in, in Maine itself, but um, one day, one day. Well, in terms of the research, my laptop the, the, where I'm speaking to you now is balanced on two box folders. And that is all the stuff that did not make it in to oh. the book. So, so there's a lot more research. So the, you know, th this series of books, it covers 300 years of history. It's a feud between two families, one Catholic and one Protestant. Um, it's a Romeo and Juliet story. It's a, it, you know, it's a, an adventure thriller, really. And The City of Tears is, is set in a little bit in Languedoc, but mostly in Paris and then The City of Tears itself, Amsterdam. And so when I was researching this period of history, so this, this book is 1572 to 1594, my real aim is just what you've said. So it's so wonderful that you said it, which is to kind of make the world come alive. 
uh, for ed all the readers so that they feel that they can smell the streets of Paris, they can hear the sounds of the boats on the canals in Amsterdam and not notice that it's research. And the only reason that the research matters, apart obviously from historical veracity, is my lead character Minu, for example, if she's running away to escape, what she got on her feet? What clothes is she wearing? Because for me, the research is all about the plot. It's all about the story. So it's building a stage set, and then you put the actors in the middle of the stage, and the audience can trust that I've got my details right, but then they should not notice, and all they should be worrying about is the story and the mystery and what's going to happen, and is my family going to survive, and are they going to get away from the massacre or not? So that's, that's for me, what the purpose of research is. You know, I love that you mention the word trust, because I think that is, that is so important um, for authors and for readers, is that, you know, you need to say, you can put yourself in my hands, and I will, I will guide you through the story, and I will not lead you astray. You know, that, that you know when you trust an author that there's not going to be this sudden clunky detail. I probably would not spot them. I actually was a history major, but my specialty <laughs> was actually 16th century England. So <laughs> those wars of religion I know about, not in France. But you, there's always someone. There's always someone who's going to pick up this book and who did a, you know, their master's thesis on the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And so you really need to get, get those details right so that they will, you know, they'll believe in yeah. everything else that you make up, the characters and the plot. That's exactly right, that, that everybody knows that if you are reading a book and you're really immersed in it, and then it's set in a real place and they say they turn left and you know there's, there's no road there, then you, you, it draws you out of the story and then you, you lose confidence, I think. Um, and I think one of the things that you know, I do is I try to put the stories of women center stage and unheard and underheard women's stories. And so my lead character, Minu and her husband, Peter, and their children, and indeed their enemies, they are all imagined, but I put them against the backdrop of the real history. They're witnesses to the real history. And the reason that it matters for me to get it right is that real people died. So it's kind of disrespectful to the, the absolute tragedy of these times. It was a, a bloody and vicious religious civil war. This, the French Wars of Religion started 1562 and went till 1594 uh, when the great French King Henry IV was crowned and brought peace to France for, uh, you know, after a generation of fighting. And I do feel really strongly that therefore you owe it to the people who lived and died to try and get it right, you know, to not sanitize history and to not, um, not manipulate it because we all know what happens when, you know, the stories and the films, they don't tell the true picture and, you know, the consequences, you know, we are who we are because of what happened before. So getting it right really matters to me. Um, and I had a lovely compliment. The book's just come out um, in, it's been a global English language publication, but also in France at the same time. And I had, you know, I was doing an interview with a Parisian journalist and he, he said, I just have to say, I, I've seen, I see Paris through different eyes having read this. And that was a compliment, because as you can imagine. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That, that is indeed <laughs> uh, a compliment. So I want to, I want to latch on to something you said about centering women's experiences, because that is one thing that really struck me, um, is that, so reading this series reminds me of, and I want you to take this in the right way, <laughs> of those old fashioned historical fiction that I fell in love with when I was a teenager. It's sort of these, you know, Raphael Sabatini, yeah, it's just yeah. action adventure and, yeah, you know, with the yeah. dashing and the, and the plots and the, you know, th there's, there's a very sort of like an Alexandre Dumas quality to some of this stuff that's going on. But at the same time, there's this big difference which is that classic sweeping adventurous history novel was about men and men's experiences. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing here is you're putting Minou and then her daughter, um, Marta, can I call her? You know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 ye
at the center of these stories. I mean, lots of interesting other characters, lots of male characters, but that I loved because it was sort of reminds me of this epic suite that I enjoyed so much, um, you know, back in the day. <laughs> But, but with women. <laughs> but with, well, th that, yeah. that is, that's so great that you say that because that was precisely my intention, that at the heart of the City of Tears, there is a mystery. Um, it's, you know, the, these are not crime novels, but they are, you know, there's a combination of history, mystery, and that sort of momentum and jeopardy of old fashioned adventure stories. And when I was first starting out, um, my first big historical novel was a novel called Labyrinth, uh, which came out back in 2005. And my wonderful dad was still alive then. And I was trying to explain to him. And I said, you know, they're like the old fashioned adventure stories you used to read me. Um, but the difference is that in my books, the women get to have the swords. Um, and my lovely dad, um, who died in 2011 and he was in his late 80s then. So he was a, an English gentleman of that generation. You know, he fought in the war and grew up in the 20s and all of these things. And he looked at me and he said, darling, I've waited all of my life for a woman on a horse with a sword to come and rescue me. <laughs> and I thought, okay, if my dad gets this, we're, we're onto something here. Because the truth is, Julia, as you know, that History as a discipline is relatively modern, even though there's obviously always been history written. It's the old cliche that history is written by the victors, but it's a cliche because it's true. And it's also written with an agenda. And when history became something that people wrote down and said, this is a history book, rather than this is the record of the day, it was almost exclusively a male discipline. And they left us out. And we were there too, women were there too. Uh, women and men working together, the stories, you know, the world was made up of women and men. And in the period of time I'm writing about in the 16th century, uh, particularly towards the end of the, the City of Tears, the men have been at war for a generation. They're not there. So I'm always, if you like, trying to be the voice of common sense here, saying, well, women must have been running the bookshops and opening the towns and guarding the gates and making the bread because the men were at war. Um, and so for me, it, it does feel that, you know, old, exactly that, old fashioned adventure stories, but we know that women are strong and purposeful and have agency. And it's a myth that women in the past only ever did embroidery. You know, we, we know this is not true. So it's about putting everybody back into the picture to tell a really great, story. Well, and I, I like the fact that you spend a lot of time focusing on um, social levels that I feel are not usually highlighted. You know, um, Menu starts out very much, you know, one of the bourgeois, um, and she, she rises a bit, you know, sort of economically and, and her, but um, the people who really matter are in that the sort of middle rank of society. I mean, you see everyone from high to low, but um, which I think is a, an exciting twist from, again, the old fashioned one, which often tended to be, you know, here's the Lord and the lady. And the other thing that I really wanted to, to comment on and compliment you on is the fact that you've made these, you've created these very strong women who become heroes of their stories but they never feel anachronistic to me. And I have read, and I think you have too, um, historical fiction where the women are, I mean, they, they're like 21st century women in, you know, pantalettes or something. Uh, they, don't, they don't seem like they really belong in their period. I think here you have women who are doing extraordinary things, but it, it resonates. So, how do you kind of manage to, to, that's a needle that you really have to thread to make them women that, that a 21st century woman can admire without making them sound like they have been parachuted in from, from our time. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, thank you for the compliment because that, it's, that is, I think, at the heart of historical fiction um, that you cannot put 21st century words into 16th century mouths. There are attitudes of the 16th century which are very far from our attitudes, although sadly maybe not quite so far from some people's attitudes, uh, <laughs> looking at the Olympic Committee at the moment, um, as they maybe should be. Um, but, but I think it's, again, it comes down to the fact that women were strong and purposeful and hardy at this 
period of time in 16th century France, um, particularly um, in the south of France, which had slightly different attitudes. Because you studied uh, the wars of religion in England, as it was called at the time, you will know that there is this tendency in the 16th century in particular to only focus on the court. But they were a tiny amount of society. Most of us, I mean, forgive me for all of you listening, if you are indeed a queen, but most of us are not the queen um, and are not going to be married to the prince. Um, we, we're the, the, the normal people, the, if you like, the heroic, ordinary people uh, for whom the decisions that are made at court will destroy their lives, will mean that they become refugees, that they will have to flee from the massacre. So there are people like us who are trying to look after their families, trying to keep their marriages going. Um, but you can never, you can never make them have my views or your, your views. Minu has to be herself as a 16th century woman. And so some of that is uncomfortable um, because certainly attitudes towards sex and violence and all of these things that you know are, are difficult sometimes to write and you and you have to respect the history you just have to respect the history but you also it's back to that that old thing the common sense you know at the heart of the city of tears is a sophie's choice dilemma yeah. um yeah. and for me i believe very strongly that although society was completely different they had a completely different sort of way of doing things I believe that if a mother loses her child, her heart breaks in the same way then as it would now. You just need to read Shakespeare. Yes, you know, yes. I remember having, having a professor who's, who's, his take on that, on you know, the enormous amount of, of child mortality that occurred was that people were not as connected to their children. And I thought, that's shit. Um, people have always been connected with the children. And you can read a few, you know, few remaining diaries that where people talk about, I remember one that, that I read that was extraordinary, actually in um, America in the 16th century, and it was a, uh, I'm sorry, the 17th century, uh, early 17th century, and um, uh, uh, a man who had lost his daughter had died at like age three, and he, it, they were just heart-wrenching. They were heart wrenching, and he would say, "I know this is God's will, and she's in a better place," which I'm sure people believed wholeheartedly. Yeah, but it's still heartbreaking. So that was really hard part for me to read. Was that? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. And do you know the thing is that when um, you know, I do all of my research, and that's a very significant part of my writing process, as you as you said, because there's a lot of history to to learn and digest and and use. Um, but once I've done all of that, I know the kind of book it's going to be, and I know I have the spine of the real history, but then I kind of start writing and see where the story takes me. So the missing child storyline was not one I had been anticipating. But of course, that's again the point of historical fiction, that the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is the most notorious engagement of the wars of religion when some 3,000 people on the 24th of August in 1572 in Paris were massacred. Uh, Huguenots massacred by Catholics and it was a plot. We'll never know quite who rang the bell and who made this happen. Um, we do still know that maybe 70,000 people died in the rest of France in copycat massacres the next couple of weeks. But my job is not to retell the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre again. My job as a, as a storyteller is to tell my family's story against that backdrop. So what happened to them? So their very personal individual tragedy against the backdrop of the history. Which is, which is what brings history to life. I mean, that's why we read historical fiction, um, it, because it is quantitatively different than reading history, you can read, you know, multiple accounts, um, but allowing, you know, as a reader, being able to sort of sink into the character and then move with her or him, you know, through these events, in this case, you know, some really horrific uh, events. So one thing that I'm, I'm interested in, because when we read history, uh, when we read historical fiction, I feel like you always feel these echoes of your own time. Uh, we live in a time with a great deal of division and conflict, you know, civil division and conflict. Um, and I'm wondering, do you, do you feel that this sort of, the other thing that I found really um, 
fascinating. And, the, and again, harking back to the sort of an older form of the genre was just the sweep of this. You know, in the first two books, you've covered, uh, I'm trying to remember when the first book starts. But, 1562, the first book. So no, yeah. it, it's up to 1594 with some interesting references <laughs> listeners to uh, something in the 19th century that That's I'm right. really yeah. curious about and can't <laughs> wait to find out in the third book. But that sort of, you know, sweep of history. And that was out of fashion for a while. That this yeah. sort of, you know, that, um, and this really is, is that. It takes a really bold stand of saying, you want to see this family and you're going to watch them through decades. Um, it, through some of the most horrific kind of of, of incidents, which I don't want our listeners to think, you know, it's a horrific book. There's wonderful, just moving, you know, uh, story. But um, what, what about our time, do you think? What in our yeah. societies right yeah. now is calling for this, is making this particular kind of history, uh, historical fiction so popular? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's a really great question because I think th this is my interpretation of it that one of the reasons that people love crime fiction and historical fiction is that they show the big emotions that we are feeling ourselves uh, fear love jealousy uh, joy ambition all of these things powerlessness very important they show the big you know the, these big emotions but on the pages of a book there is resolution so, uh, you know, I write stories with a beginning, a middle and an end. When people have, you know, read The City of Tears, I want them to be putting it down and going, well, that was a ride, but I know, <laughs> I know what happened. I have answers. And I think particularly in these times where there is so much that is unanswerable and so much um, up in the air and we, you know, we don't know what's happening to the world. I think a lot of people feel great deal of despair when they look at how we're mucking things up. In a book, there is an answer. And actually there is a sense of justice. There is a sense of right, you know, wins over the wrong. Um, and I think with this period of history, the 16th century, as you say, it is a very bloody century. Um, it is about faith, but everybody knows that wars of religion are not about faith. They're about power and influence. And at the French court, there is Catherine de Medici, the, you know, a great towering figure of the 16th century, who is marrying her daughter off to the Huguenot in order to try to bring priests to France. There is another Catholic family that is at war with them. So there is a, a, a three-way power struggle at court. And essentially, that power struggle draws everybody in France into it. Because I profoundly believe that most most people do not want to be at war with their neighbors. Most people do not want to define themselves as I'm a Catholic and therefore I must hate you because you're not. Um, and it's very interesting at the beginning of the wars of religion, 1562, people don't define themselves in that way. But very quickly they are told the Huguenots, the Protestants as it is, are the enemy within. So they are, if you, if you're, you support them, then you're against us. And we have seen, and you know, my Lord, you guys have seen, <laughs> How easy it is, how easy it is to turn people against each other um, and how easy it is for people to essentially get carried up in the madness of the crowd. Um, and, you know, and that is really, I think, on the pages of historical fiction, in the end, it's going to come right. In the real world, it doesn't necessarily come right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, and that's why we read. That's why we read. I, yeah, I think so. You know, I've, I found with um, my friends, I have a lot of writer friends and obviously and a lot of us are reading historical fiction as as you know a bit of an escape it's like i don't yeah. want to deal with what's going on here um also i do think there's sort of a comfort when you are living through history which we are i mean you know you're always living through history but we're living through capital h history yeah yeah right yeah. now in in yeah. the past past 4 years for for both of our countries um I think there's a comfort to looking at other periods where people have been through, I mean, you hear things like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and you wonder, oh, and the, the copycat massacres afterwards. And you think, how did people 
do that. Well, they did. They lived through it and they, mm -hmm. they did what they had to, to keep their families together and, and keep food on the table. And, um, and eventually, you know, they survived at least the people, yes. the people that, the people that we care about are surviving. Some of them survive. They don't all survive. Some of them, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to get into it. Because yeah, no. I, and, and also I think, I think the thing is that, um, what you just said is so true. When I was first publishing, I would say in my events, you know, we, of course, people don't know they're living through history, but, and when I published the burning chambers, I had to stop saying that because we did know we were living through history. And then in this last year, not just the relative issues of our relative governments, and we won't get into that, but the pandemic as well. The pandemic will be as the First World War was, that everything will be divided into before and after that, because it is something that has affected the world. And who of us five years ago thought that would happen, that we would live through that? And it's just a reminder, and this is why I think it's, a lot of historical fiction novelists, I think, like, like me, are optimists because history is a pendulum. It goes backwards and forwards. It isn't, sadly, a march forward to better times for all. People get complacent. They forget that peace has to be guarded, that civil liberties have to be guarded, that um, equality has to be guarded, that storytelling, you know, all of these things. It, things get terrible again and then they get better again. Um, and it's always the words that matter. It's always the talking that brings people back to the negotiating table and all of these things. So I think it is very strange to be writing, you know, this is a diaspora story in the yes. end. Yeah. You know, it's 300 years, as you say, the prologue is in 1862 and the descendants of these two families, uh, the Joubert family, my sort of uh, first family, if you like, and the descendants of their enemies, they will finally come face to face in 1862, 300 years after this feud began. And they are people who have been exiled from their homes. They are refugees. They've had to go to the other side of the world. In book three, I'm go, they, they leave Amsterdam, they go to the Canary Islands and some go to the new world. So to you guys, and the others go to South Africa. Um, and it's always that thing of carrying that sense of home with you, but when your home has been taken away from you. So it is, it is strange. I stood in the graveyard in Franschhoek where the novel begins in 2010 and first had the idea for these books. And the, there wasn't a refugee crisis then. But how quickly things can change. Yes. How quickly. Yeah. As, as the people of that time, you know, find living through. Um, so I am going to pivot a little bit away from the City of Tears because I said before, when we were talking before we went live, that I wanted to ask you about this. And you did say the words matter. So that gives me an intro <laughs> on that one. And um, I want to say one of the things that I was very impressed when I was uh, reading up about you so I could you know, <laughs> be intelligent um, in this was um, the fact that you had founded um, the Women's Prize which has become, uh, you know, an extremely distinguished uh, literary award. Uh, and you've also, uh, which I, you know, I, that I had heard of. I didn't realize that you were connected with it, but I've heard of it, of course. But you also um, are part of, I'm going to make sure I've got the, the word right, <laughs> the Discoveries Project or program, which is about pulling out new voices, women's new voices, um, and mentoring them and, and seeing, you know, having them. And you mentioned something else that I didn't jot down when we were talking before, and now I can't recall it. But talk, talk a little bit about that because I love that um, it's, it's been an important part of my life. Uh, one of the first things I did when I became published was joined um, Sisters in Crime, which in the United States okay. was formed in the 1980s, uh, specifically to, to, to bring women authors you know, out into the light because there was this gross disparity between the books that were um, getting prizes and getting awards and were getting reviews and then the rest of us, the rest of us being women. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting to see from my, um, from this side of the pond, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Well, it's, um, it was precisely that. I think um, 
I've been very lucky. Um, you know, I don't think any of us, none of us become a novelist uh, thinking you're going to, this is going to be your career and you're going to, you know, support a family on being a novelist. And then, so when, then when that happens, that's really pretty surprising. And it kind of happened, didn't happen to me till I was 45. So I was already the person I was, you know, uh, when I had, you know, uh, you know, wrote a novel that just had that great swell of, you know, good support underneath it. But I do think that it's up to all of us to support each other. Um, women standing together and I think and it's not in any way um, you know when I'm setting up the prize a lot of journalists would go oh you don't like men then you'd go no 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 that's really very daft I adore men my husband is a man and so is my son you know um, and all you know but you know you, the daft stuff but it was more about exactly as you say that there wasn't a problem with women getting published at least certain kind of women getting published there were absolutely issues with uh, black women women of color women from um, you know with disability you know there, there was a quite a narrow band but women were being published in the UK but when it came to the major literary awards fewer than nine percent of women ever shortlisted for literary awards, the, the, the big ones were women. So there was an issue about the honouring and admiring and valuing of women's writing. It was seen as, well, that's women's writing and literature with a capital L is this neutral thing. But when you decode that, it was actually a certain sort of white male writing. And so in the spirit of support, set up a literary prize to say, okay, every year we're going to honour and celebrate and shout from the rooftops about amazing novels written by women in English from all over the world. So it was set up internationally, it was set up to be diverse, and it was set up in the spirit of celebration, not of complaint. Um, because I saw no benefit in going to all the other prizes and going, oh, you're leaving the women out. You know, they're, they're their prizes, so let's do something positive. It was, you know, 25 years ago, Thank the Lord there was no social media at the time. I can't imagine how terrible that would have been. Um, but as it was, it was, um, it was very, very interesting. And people were very resistant to it because quite often great, really lovely people don't like to feel they're being criticized and felt criticized. But as it went on, people started to realize, and some of your, the listeners um, now will be uh, aware of maybe of a novel by Anne Michaels called Fugitive Pieces, which is a really wonderful novel three generations of Jewish boys and men in the Second World War from uh, Poland and then uh, Greece and then Canada, that, that Jewish diaspora. And she is a poet and she had been writing this novel for a long time and it was published in the UK and no reviews, no attention at all. It yeah. had sold about 20 copies, you know, or something, I can't remember what, and it won the prize. And everybody started to say, well, how have we never heard of this novel? Well you know and there <laughs> this is yeah. how you've not heard of the novel because you've so not heard of it yeah and it's now sold 18 million copies throughout the world and it's a brilliant book so you know so i feel very strongly about that and and discoveries is part of the same thing that within the women's prize we've always had a an educational um side to it and about trying to reach out to women who 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 have got great stories to tell but don't necessarily feel comfortable coming to a literary festival or coming to a bookshop event like this. And it's our responsibility, you know, as published and successful writers to try to open the doors. Um, you know, it's again, my lovely mum used to say, she's sadly also gone now. When I was talking about setting up the Women's Prize, she said, so it's not about um, shutting the doors to anybody else. It's just getting a bigger table and more chairs. And I said, that's exactly it, Ma. Um, so for me, all of these things come together. And the thing that we were talking about beforehand, before I know you, you're going to go to some questions, is um, something that I've set up. And I would love um, you to spread the word. And you've already helped me with this, Julia, and everybody uh, watching, which is um, a campaign called Woman, singular, in history. And I just simply, um, because I do so much research, it has really struck me how very easy it is for women's achievements to be left out of history or to vanish. Um, you know, all of the black American women who were mathematicians and scientists for NASA, who, if it wasn't for the film, many people would not know their names, you know? Um, the fact that oh, it was a woman who invented the dishwasher, maybe we're not surprised. It was a woman who invented uh, windscreen wipers on cars. Um, the great actress, Hedy Lamarr, glamorous, beautiful person who was a dress designer, 
also is the person who invented Wi-Fi. Um, so for me, um, this campaign called Woman in History, it's just a hashtag woman in history. And I asked some amazing writers, you included, to for my launch of the City of Tears to nominate somebody. And you nominated Zenobia, uh, which is a fabulous choice. Um, I launched it on social media last week and I've been overwhelmed. We've had thousands of entries, including from people like Martina Navratilova and Kim Cottrell and, you know, wonderful people. So I really want to reach this out as far as possible because it's the same thing. Let's make sure that women's achievements are as visible and they don't disappear. So that was a very long answer, but I feel very passionately about us all supporting each other, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that was a fabulous answer. I'm feeling <laughs> really charged up right now. <laughs> like, yes, yes, because it, it is so true. It is so true that, um, I mean, in history, of course, it's, it's easy for women's voices to slip away because they weren't centered in any narrative. Um, you have, uh, you know, a, a far fewer women who were perhaps literate or writing, or if they were writing, it was sort of dismissed and... Um, and then, of course, in our contemporary society, you've, you've got, as I love your mother's uh, expression about making the table larger and putting in more chairs. Um, but we've all seen the phenomenon where, or she's, all women have, have noticed the phenomenon where if there is, you know, one woman in a room full of men, then women are represented. If there are two or three women at that table, the women are taken over. Um, so... <laughs> Which, which is, I think, one of the reasons we need these kind of women-centered spaces and women-centered intellectual movements. Yeah, well, I was, you know, the, um, the, one of the uh, organizations that sent me in a nomination a couple of days ago was the English Chamber Orchestra. And I was like, oh, and of course, in classical music is exactly that, that often people say, why have you not programmed any classical music by women? And people will look you in the eye and say, there aren't any women composers. <laughs> You go, well, my friend. Um, but for me, it's, it's about education. And as I say, it's always about celebration. It's always about let's celebrate what these women did rather than have complain about them not being there. Let's just put their names there. Um, and, you know, and, the, and this is, you know, the thing with the City of Tears that Minou Joubert and her family, you know, Minou is the daughter of a bookseller. Thank you. Um, <laughs> very good. Very, very good product placement. Um, you know, she's a daughter of a bookseller because one of the things that you will know from your own studies, Julia, is that what, it was a very attractive Protestantism to women because within that, women were allowed to publish and write. So there were a lot of women writing theological tracts in the 16th century. And that was, again, I, I love that, that actually that sort of opportunity made it a very attractive religion in some respects for people. They, you know, women could have their voice. Um, and, you know, and the, these things are how uh, societies evolve, as we know. And in the book, obviously, it's very important. And she has, you know, a daughter and her daughter will carry on uh, that story, that family line. Yeah, the written word is really a, a center, becomes a center point of the plot uh, in this. The fact that there are... yeah. I mean, there are, there are mysterious things that are written down that we have to discover, and then there are accounts that are written down um, of, of of people's lives and their women's lives and their experience. Um, and like I said, I'm I'm really looking forward to finding out what's going to happen because I did <laughs> I did finish this. And it was like such a roller coaster, uh, such an emotional roller coaster of a book, and then I sort of closed and I'm like, okay, now what happens next? Which I guess we're going to have to yeah. wait for two years to find out. Well, I've got to write it. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's um, what I know, always yeah. say when people <laughs> ask me about the next book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, know, I, I, I kind of know. I know. I know where things are going and I know where they end up, you know, because my inspiration for the whole series came to me in the graveyard in Franschhoek, as I said, in 2010. So I started at the end. I thought, OK, how did these people get here? Yeah. Who are they? What are their stories? So it is a big sweep, a big family saga, really. Um, but, you know, the City of Tears, particularly because it has a mystery at the heart of it, um, that, that has a slightly different tone from The Burning Chambers. And book three, there are actually four in, in all. Uh, book three is, in fact, a pirate story. It's pirate girls. Um, you know, so, yeah, you know, so we have Burning Chambers is, is fire, 
uh, City of Tears, of course, is water. Book three is air, you know, because a lot of it is on the sea. Yeah. And book four is in South Africa. And of course, that's the red earth of, of right, Africa the red that earth they there. discover. So I see yeah, Grace's yeah. Grace has popped onto the screen, yeah, which means that it must avoid. be question time. Yes, it is. I think we ended actually kind of at the perfect moment. Um, <laughs> the first question I'm actually going to open with is from Joshua, who is a South African uh, Joubert living in Portland, Maine. No, so kind of ties, right? Joshua, hi. <laughs> well, I found your name, you know, in the graveyard in Franschhoek. Um, and that's why I chose the name Joubert, because I, I was there and I saw it. And I saw that the Joubert's had come from the southwest of France originally via Amsterdam. So you are the hero of your family are the heroes <laughs> of this. And the final book is all set in South Africa. I don't know if you know whereabouts you were, but my family will land in, in, in Cape Town at the end of book three. And then we'll be traveling through Stellenbosch, Parle and Drakenstein to, to Franschhoek, which of course means the French corner uh, in Afrikaans. That's, that's what it stands for. So... Yes, he is actually, he's from Cape Town um, and went to Stellenbosch. So it's kind of, kind of perfect. Brilliant. Well, th this, then my friend, this book is for you, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> All right. His question is, uh, what is your favorite historical fiction? Kind of a broad one, probably hard to answer. But. Well, no, I, I think um, the, the hardest one, and, I'm, and I'd like to know what Julia reads as well for this. The hardest one is when people say, well, what's your favorite author? And because we are authors and we have a lot of friends who are authors, we can only name people who are dead because otherwise you miss somebody out and your friends are furious. Um, but I, I really um, love Mary Renault, you know, all of the old, old classic Greek uh, stories. I do love um, uh, Julia mentioned Dumas, uh, the, you know, the musketeers. I like all the swashbuckling. I love Walter Scott, um, Ivanhoe, you know, that I f first fell in love. You know, I'm a medievalist, really, uh, with all of those stories. And R Robert Graves, but also, um, you know, the, the women that are often overlooked, like Jean Plady, Georgette Heyer, real sense. You know, they're always dismissed as being bodice rippers. But, you know, now we know from Bridgerton that people want the bodices to be ripped. So this is all very straightforward. And um, uh, that, that's all really good. And I, and I think in the modern day, uh, you know, Ken Follett, I think, is terrific. I think Philippa Gregory is terrific. I think Hilary Mantel is... Def I think we... Um, you know, Philippa does one particular thing and Hilary does one particular thing. Ken Follett and I kind of exist in a, a, in a more similar area in that we're interested in page turning historical fiction, um, you know, so that there is a, there's a really big forward momentum. But Julia, who, who, who do you read? You mentioned Dumas, but do you, you have any actually mentioned a, You've actually mentioned yeah. a bunch of my favorites. Um, and you, you know what I was thinking as you were, you know, you're mentioning, well, I mean, obviously we're talking with you and Follett and um, Hilary Mandel, whose books were just so brilliant. I feel like we're really seeing a revival of yeah. of the sort of these big uh, big fat historical novel yeah. genre, mm -hmm. um, some of which are these swashbuckling adventures, and some of which are much more. I mean, uh, Mantel stuff is much more interior, um, but but just you know the delight with which people are plunging, and, and with a book, you know, when you've got a book this big, you can really lose yourself in the history for. Um, for a long time, which I think is one of the great delights of it. Yeah. Um. Perfect for lockdown. Yes. <laughs> Keep you going through lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> this is perfect. You're setting me up for every question with the perfect segue. Okay. <laughs> the next one I have is um, any new favorite reads from during lockdown and quarantine? Oh, well, yeah, let's have a think. Well, um, obviously with the Women's Prize, I... Um, I have a period of time always in the year where I'm reading exclusively fiction um, authored by women. Um, and I, I would recommend to anybody who hasn't read it, our current winner, our current queen of the Women's Prize, um, which is Maggie O'Farrell's Hamlet. Um, and it was wonderful to see her for the first time ever go into the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, it, it blew her away that sort of, that, you know, she's a, such a modest and wonderful writer. Um, so I, I would certainly recommend that. And I would actually also recommend, if people haven't read it, last year's winner, which is An American Marriage by Tiare Jones, which I think is um, a superb, superb novel as well. I've actually been... Um, writing nonfiction during lockdown because I have a book coming out. I'm a carer uh, for my 90 year old mother-in-law and was a carer for my father 
before everybody lives with us. We all live together. Um, so I've written a, a non-fiction book on care. So I've been reading quite a lot of um, books in that field uh, because I think there is, I'm very interested in positive aging and the fact that um, older people are always, it's always presented as a problem that people are living longer. Uh, when actually it should be a cause for celebration and um, we should be, you know, thrilled about this. So, I, you know, and I'm not sure how many books are very English specific or whether you have them over there. But, uh, you know, one of the, the great books, I think, is um, Atul Gawande, um, which is a book about, you know, how how to live and how to die well. Um, and I, I think, you know, these are very popular books in the UK at the moment. I don't, I don't know if it's such a big genre in, in America, but... Um, so I, I switch backwards and forwards between fiction and nonfiction. What about you, I, Julia? I, well, I was going to say, I think in America, we like books about improving ourselves. <laughs> you know, it's right. like if you just eat the right things and you juice and you cleanse and you exercise, then you'll live forever and we don't need to think about dying. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, actually, I, I actually have my... Um, my laptop stacked up is on top of some of the books that I've, I've been reading. I also have been reading a lot of women recently. Um, I have uh, Elena Ferrante's The Lying Life of Adults. I don't think any of these are super, super new. Um, yeah. Made by Stephanie Land, which is just a really, I actually got that at print. Um, so, <laughs> you know, thank you, print. And then, um, oh, here, this one I can pull out and show, which I have loved, which is um, Monogamy by Sue Miller, um, which, you know, is, is again, sort of escapism for me in that it's other people's lives, you know, it's just like very, very granular and detailed about sort of this marriage and the family and um, anyway, so that's, those are my most recent ones. Oh, fantastic. You just created like the perfect book list for people to just go on <laughs> in and just lock them down. Um, this is actually a question that just got sent in to me, but what are uh, both of your feelings on kind of modernist takes on history? So um, like Maria Devana Headley's new Beowulf translation or um, Hilary Mantel's more modernist take on, on Cromwell. And I feel like that's a kind of an emerging, emerging genre in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think um, in terms of being modernizing, translations are incredibly significant, whether it's a translation of the ancient Greek myths or whether it's Beowulf or indeed whether it's the Bible. Um, you know, it, there, there is a, a great deal of nuance that is different depending on which translation you have of some of these things. And, uh, you know, the, the um, British academic Edith Hall is very good on that, on, particularly on Homer. Um, I think that, I think what Hillary does, I wouldn't say that it's particularly modernist in that I think she's entirely immersed in the uh, 16th century and, and knows her man backwards. I think that she uses a, a certain sort of language which is more contemporary possibly than I, I would use in uh, my fiction, but partly because, of course, I'm writing in English about people who would have been speaking in Occitan or French. So there's already, the, you know, a, a segue. I think the worst sort of historical fiction is when people rush in every moment to go, hello, my lord, and everybody's, you know, my lord this and my lady that. And, you know, people didn't do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that we all are writing, in a way, historical fiction for a modern ear. Um, we have to, because actually, if we were writing in a genuinely 16th century style, it would be just too claggy, uh, too complicated, too overblown. And it's why often when people go back to 19th century novels, they're a bit disappointed because they've seen Oliver Twist on the television and then they go and read Oliver Twist and it's very, very, very wordy. So I think we, there's always been this sort of sense of you, uh, the great, American poet Wallace Stevens, you know, there's a, an amazing poem called The Idea of Order at Key West. And it's a, a description of what art is really about a, a woman walking along the sea um, and how the way that you can't just describe the sound of the sea because that's just the sea. So there is always a level of artificialness, artifice. And I think so. I, I think it's I think it's good because I think it brings the past to life, but it makes it uh, relatable. I suppose, for, for a modern reader, but with the caveat that you must not 
you must not muck with the history and you must not um, put modern attitudes. So I, I have to leave the 21st century woman outside the door when I come and sit at this computer. I can't bring my views in and put them in with that caveat. Yeah, it's good. I, I would agree with that. And, you know, one of the things that um, I always try and remember, I, I don't know who said this, but is that when we write, we are not, we're not writing life on the page or reality. We are writing a facsimile that you, the reader, will believe is real. Yeah. Um, you know, real life, uh, as Kate noticed, is messy and often doesn't have a nice conclusion, something satisfying at the end, um, but fiction does. I certainly, I like the, in the right context, I, I like the modern vernacular being used in historical fiction because I think that it can make it more immediately approachable and understandable, especially, I think it's especially good in something like, um, you know, Wolf Hall, since we're talking about Hillary Mantel, where as I, it's a very interior book, as I said. It's really about, it, it, it's classic sort of modern literature in the sense that it is the study of one human's life, a deep, deep study. It happens to be one of the more interesting human beings uh, who, you know, who lived through incredibly historic times and interacted with amazing people. But the fact that we are, do have that more contemporary voice, um, you know, helps a lot. I think it would, it, you're right, it would sort of clunk a little bit in the City of Tears because it would take away from that, that feel of here we are with everyone being dashed off. Um, on the other side of it, and I, I wish I could remember the title of this, but maybe it's better that I didn't. A number of years ago, I read um, a novel set during the English Civil War, which is like another favorite historical period of mine. And the entire thing was written in a very good facsimile of, of 17th century yeah. dialogue. You know, certainly the way, I mean, I've actually studied original 17th century pamphlets and writing as, as part of my master's degree. Um, and Boy, is fiction. It was, yeah, yeah. this was awful. It was, yeah. like, it was like, oh, I just, it's like, no, here they're going to talk some more. <laughs> Shoot me now. Um, I don't feel like, like, if you really want to read 17th century language, um, you know, you can go to the Folger Library in Washington, D.C., and they've got a lot of material there. Um, if you want to sit down and lose yourself in history and feel like you're there, then too much authenticity yeah. in language yeah. creates a barrier. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic, all right, we have time for one more. Uh, this one comes from Laura. Um, I, know, I know we've asked a lot of kind of book recommending questions, but this is, can you recommend any of your nonfiction book sources from your research on the wars of religion in France? Is there one or two that really stand out to you or that you return to? Um, your books have inspired an interest in the era and the wars themselves. Oh, well, Laura, thank you. That's, that's really great. Um, there is a fantastic book. Again, it, this is difficult, of course, because I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, we can order things all over the world. I mean, I, I hope that you will get everything from print, um, but they might not have this. Um, uh, yeah, so there is um, a book uh, called The Huguenots by an author called Geoffrey Treasure. Um, and that, I, that was very much a Bible for me. Um, it, he was, you know, because it covers all of it from start to finish. Um, in uh, a lot of the novel is set in Amsterdam. We haven't really talked much about Amsterdam. And the period that it, it, in, is in Amsterdam is from 1572 to 1594. And it includes the, the big uh, moment of turmoil in Amsterdam, which is called the alteration when in the space of an afternoon, uh, Amsterdam turns from Catholic to Protestant and not a single person is killed. And it's a, really a miracle in the context of the wars of religion through Europe. And there is a, a, a brilliant book um, uh, by Geoffrey Sholto, which is about Amsterdam in that period, because funnily enough, um, all countries tend to focus on one bit of their history, often to the exclus you know, exclusion of everything else. Um, and in Holland, they studied the golden age in the 17th century. So when I was asking all my Dutch friends for 
uh, help with this period. They were going, we don't really know anything about this. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's not very helpful. And I do not speak Dutch. So that was not, no, not very helpful. So I, I found that really, really good. And um, I'm just trying to see if I've, there's a particularly brilliant biography of Catherine de Medici and a complete and, and a very um, they are worth reading a biography of Catherine de Medici because her life story is in a way the story of this period of France um, and she I would suggest is a much maligned person because she is was a powerful queen um, so th you know, those are three that I, I think would would give some more depth if you want to read some more um, uh, Dr Emily Gary she also helped me enormously with uh, Sainte Chapelle. There's a there's a whole storyline about relics and stolen relics and um, that side of uh, the Catholic faith at that time. And she was very brilliant in terms of Notre Dame and Sainte Chapelle and and helping me around Paris in the days where I could go and do my research in person. Fantastic. Thank you. I think it's a perfect note to end on. Thank you both for virtually being here tonight. Um, we have plenty of copies. Feel free to order them at print. And um, thank you again. This is fascinating. So great. Well, thank you so much. And Julia, such a joy to talk to you. It's always, I think, for all of us as authors, we, one of the reasons we like doing events is to see other authors. And it's just always such a pleasure to be in a conversation with a fellow traveler. <laughs> I have just enjoyed this so much, Kate. And God willing, at some point, we will all be able to meet in the same room and have a conversation there. We'll, we'll look forward to that. The next book. We'll do the next book. Book three. Thank you. Yes, exactly. I'll be there. We'll be there. All right. Thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye.